Let's take a look at the regression line itself, the line of best fit. In this graph here, if I were to sketch the regression line, I'm looking for a line that can fit the data in the best linear pattern I can find. So I'm going to have something that looks probably like that. And although it's not a perfect fit to the data, it has roughly the same number above and below uh, and kind of follows the general trend of the data. Now with the, when I say sketch the regression line, you have to be aware there are multiple terms for this. I'll try to use regression line primarily, but sometimes it's called the line of best fit, which makes sense. It's a line that fits the data well. The least squares line, and at first that won't really make sense, but uh, the way that it's mathematically calculated involves figuring out how far away all these points are from the line, uh, and then squaring them and trying to make that number as small as possible. So although you don't have to worry about the details of that calculation, uh, the idea is it's trying to find the smallest square. So that's why it's called the least squares line. Uh, and then it's also sometimes called the least squares regression line. So kind of combining the two. Uh, and then sometimes made long and then shortened with an abbreviation, so LSR. So although I'll try to use regression line, just know there are many terms uh, for this. So calculating the regression line and interpreting its meaning, you would have to take a set of data, a set of two quantitative variables, and plug it into some sort of calculator, uh, whether it be uh, handheld or online. So in this example, we're comparing the weight of a car and its miles per gallon. And since we're assuming that the weight of the car is probably going to have more effect causing the miles per gallon than the other way around, we're going to say that the weight of the car is the x, the miles per gallon is the y. So we have the explanatory over here with the car weight and the miles per gallon, the response variable. If you take all this data and you plug it into uh, StatKey Online, you're going to come up with uh, some statistics that look something like this. So on the right side, it will give you all this information. It's the same type of data you would get from like a TI-83, for example. Uh, first thing we're looking for is to construct a regression line to figure out what is uh, the y equals mx plus b line that we're trying to get. And we know that we always need the slope first and then we need the y-intercept. So with those two parts that should be enough to construct the line. So we're always going to start with y equals Sometimes it's written as y hat because it's a predicted value of y. But y equals, and then we're going to plug our slope in, negative 0 0.0035, and then we're going to multiply the slope by x. So slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b form, we're going to put x next to our slope. And then finally plus b means plus our y intercept, so plus 37.3. Continuing on here, we look at our x, if we're going to find our label for x, and our label for x is going to be our car weight, so the weight of our car in pounds. Uh, the units for our y, our label is going to be in miles per gallon, so it's just mpg, miles per gallon. The y-intercept, then, is an interesting thing. It's when we have zero of x, it's how much of y we have. So in the context of this problem, when we have a zero pound car, we can expect to get this many of y, 37.3 miles per gallon. So 37.3 mpg when the car weighs zero pounds, when x is equal to zero. Kind of a weird thing to think about. Uh, almost always the y-intercept is irrelevant uh, in terms of trying to actually make sense of what it would mean in an example because it's so far away from the rest of the data uh, that it's a huge outlier um, so we we tend to not talk about it a whole lot and then finally the slope the slope says every time you go up one in the x this is what happens to the y so if you increase one pound the weight of your car you can expect your miles per gallon to go down just a tiny little bit. And so here we see negative 0 0.0035 miles per gallon per pound. So every pound we go up, we decrease that many miles per gallon. And then just to see that written down if you're taking notes, 
every increase of one pound of the car is linked to an average decrease of that many miles per gallon, 0 0.0035. We say is linked, not necessarily uh, causes, because we don't know that the weight causes this, but we do know from our data that they are linked, so we don't want to jump to assumptions. If we look here at the data for the weight versus mile per gallon, uh, let's play around and see what can happen if we were to add an extra data point uh, to our graph here. We see our slope negative 0 0.0035. Our correlation is a little bit less than negative 0.8. It's closer to 0 than to uh, 0.8. So if I edit my data, I can paste in a new value. And the value I'm going to try is 42.50 and 22.5, something that should roughly land right on the line, on the trend line right here. And you can see there is the new point I just added, roughly on the trend line. My slope did not change. By adding a new point pretty much on the trend line, I'm not going to change the trend. I actually just confirmed that it was a good pattern. Uh, however, my correlation, which was not quite as good as 0.8 before, is now negative 0.82. So my correlation got better. By adding points close to the line, you're going to improve your correlation. And uh, the opposite of that, if I were to take this new point and move it way out here, you can see my correlation is going down. As I pull this away from the trend line, I am taking, hurting the correlation. Move it back, I help it. Um, you also see as I move a point away, it pulls the slope. So I had negative point three zero zero three five, and you can see it going down over here on the right as I move this point. And if I move this point below the current trend line, it's going to continue pulling it the same way. Think of each of these uh, dots on here as almost having their own gravitational pull. And as you move the dot, the line wants to be closer to that dot. So if you add a new point over on this end, it's going to kind of tilt it down. It's pulling on the line and vice versa. When you go up here, it's going to pull the line upward. So depending on where you put your point, you can either pull the whole thing up without moving the slope, pull the whole thing down without moving the slope, or on one side where you kind of tilt it. So there's lots of different things you can do with data, but putting it right on the trend line is not going to affect your slope at all, your original calculated slope. Putting it somewhere farther away is going to tilt the slope quite a bit and hurt your correlation. Quick uh, view on those uh, things again if you're writing this down. Putting a point on the line does not change the line, but it does make the correlation better points off the line makes the correlation worse, which means closer to zero, and it pulls that gra uh, regression line like gravity closer to itself. So it's going to pull on that, tug on that regression line. And then the last thing we didn't look at is points that dominate the regression line are called influential points. So if you put a point way farther out than the rest of the data, so you get something, let's say, way out on this end, on the extreme side, in the 6,000s, pretty much wherever I move this, the core or the trend line is going to follow. Whenever you get that far out, the trend line does whatever that far out point says. So that's why you have to be careful if you have one point that's really far away from the others because it can completely dominate your slope. Just going to go back, finish up with one more example similar to the one we did earlier. Uh, where we try to figure out our x and y units, uh, interpret the slope, and interpret the y-intercept. We're given this equation of a line, and it's referring to hours spent on Facebook causing a decrease in test score. Now, since we're saying that one causes the other, we assume that one is an explanatory variable. Our cause, our hours on Facebook, is going to be um, our x units, so we're measuring that in hours. And then on the other side, we have our test scores. So we are measuring how many points you go up or down. In this case, this is the decreases. So how many points you go down on your tests. Your slope is always rise over run, y over x. So it is how many points you increase or decrease per hour on Facebook. So how many y changes per x. In this case, we said that our slope is the blue number, negative 2.26. So negative 2.26 points are lost per hour spent on Facebook. 
and seeing that as a sentence, an increase of one hour on Facebook is linked to an average decrease of 2.26 points on tests. Uh, we say linked to, uh, in this case we can say causes because we know that it causes. There, let's say there's an experiment done here that can prove that it caused it. Uh, but we also use the terminology in average. And the reason we say an average decrease is because the trend line is not perfect, but on average it predicts uh, this many points are going to be lost for each hour spent on Facebook.